Microsoft Nexus is really great. Um, Newman has been providing space. But if anybody actually has space that can uh, accommodate 100 people or more, uh, please let us know. So we have a bunch of events in the queue. All we really need is the space. Um, so there's that. Um, I guess with that, let me introduce uh, Marcel, who uh, I guess originally come back from Google, uh, working on F1, and has been with Pivera for two years. Um, here to talk about the college, just like GA. Um, I know a bunch of people that are here uh, are anxious to actually play with it at work for a while. Um, so let's see. Andrew, thank you for being Thank you for the introduction and thank uh, mm -hmm. to think at Nexus for providing the space. Uh, it's a very nice space, in my opinion, too. <laughs> All right, so I'll be giving a tech talk about Impala. And uh, I'll start up talking about the goals and what Impala looks like and feels like from the user's perspective. And uh, then I'll be talking about Impala performance and in particular, uh, talking about the benchmarks that we did for the GA release that, as I mentioned, came out last week. And I'll go on to talk about Impala internals architecture and then um, conclude with a comparison of Impala against existing systems that fall in the same space. Uh, this talk is interactive. Feel free to interrupt at any point in time and ask questions. Uh, I think we have microphones in the aisles. Yeah, there are others. Do you know if the microphones are turned on? All right. Off we go. So Impala started out as a, the purpose of Impala was to produce a general purpose SQL engine. So um, while Impala is being used and mainly advertised for AdWord querying, it was actually not designed for that particular purpose. The purpose was to have something that generally works for all kinds of SQL workloads in the Hadoop ecosystem. So uh, from really short running queries to long running queries, from transactional to um, analytical workloads, depending on the capabilities of the underlying storage manager. Um, the second goal was to have Impala run directly inside of Hadoop. So there are competitive systems that uh, try to make Hadoop accessible for analytical workloads, and they often hang off on the side of Hadoop and run in a separate cluster, and run off different file formats, etc. So there's a clear separation, and with Impala, you'll be able to run uh, your analytical queries, your SQL workload, directly on the native file formats that are popular inside of Hadoop, and against popular Hadoop storage managers and in particular, share a cluster with your existing uh, MapReduce installation. A third goal was to provide high-performance high uh, query execution, SQL execution for Hadoop, and to that end, Impala was written completely from scratch in C++, and uh, not Java, at least the execution side of it. And uh, it also uses runtime code generation and does not reuse anything um, such as MapReduce or existing open source query engines such as Postgres. From the user's perspective, Impala runs as a distributed service, uh, which means that you have Impala daemons running on all of your nodes in the cluster, and you interact with Impala via ODBC or JDBC. So uh, if you have a query tool such as a BI tool, that speaks OVC JDBC, you can interact with Impala. You can also, there's also a command line interface, and there is a, uh, a UI tool called Hue that also allows you to interact with Impala directly and run queries. When a query comes in, it is distributed and run on all the nodes in the cluster that have relevant data for the query. Impala at the moment does not uh, support fault tolerance. That means that if any of the nodes uh, that the query runs on fails, while the query is running, the query is aborted and will have to be restarted. Uh, it does not mean that the cluster itself becomes inoperable. So no failures themselves, only for the queries that are running on the nodes at the time. <clears throat> and part is a query engine, and we try very much to uh, make it fit in well into the existing Hadoop ecosystem. In particular, if you're already using Hive to run SQL queries, we wanted you to be able to start up Impala relatively quickly. 
to that end, Impala reuses the metadata that uh, you create through Hive and that is stored in a Hive component called Metastore. Metastore basically maps your physical data onto logical relational tables, and those tables, when you bring up Impala, would be visible in, in Impala directly and right away. Um, Impala, like I said, runs on existing popular Hadoop file formats. In particular, you can run it against text data and LZO compressed text data, and also uh, sequence files with various compression codecs and Avro data files, and also a new common format called K that I'll be talking about in some more detail later on. Uh, K is a joint development with Twitter and Cloudera, and uh, we think it will bring great benefits to uh, analytical queries in Hadoop in general. Impala is a SQL query engine, and the SQL dialect that it supports is uh, basically SQL 92. So you get uh, insert, you get basically bulk insert, you get select, project, join, you can do aggregations, uh, there's a union statement, there's an order by statement, in conventional with a clause, and uh, you also have inline views. The only thing that is part of SQL 92 that does not support are correlated subqueries but basically everything uh, is supported by Impala. Impala also supports a limited form of PDL, data definition language, so uh, create table and alter table statements are also supported to some extent. Hive still has more of those commands supported in general, so uh, what is not available through Impala, you can easily execute through Hive. Now, compared to Hive, Impala arrives with a number of functional limitations. <clears throat> that are still part of the uh, 1.0 GA release. In particular, Impala does not support user-defined functions, and it also does not support uh, user-defined file formats, quote-unquote, also known as CERDES, serialization, deserialization objects in Hive. Impala um, lets you run queries over flat relational tables, so right now it does not support complex types, such as arrays, structs, or maps. Um, all joins, there's an operational limitation, which is that all joins are executed as hash joins. In fact, they are in memory hash joins. And uh, the limitation that imposes it is that the right-hand side table of your join has to fit into the aggregate memory of all nodes on which the query is running. So in practice, that means you can run joins against fairly large tables. Most uh, clusters these days have quite a large amount of memory. <coughs> So far, I've talked about the capabilities uh, running against HDFS. So HDFS is one of the supported storage managers. The other storage manager that uh, Impala supports is HBase. HBase has different properties. In particular, it allows you to run um, online workloads. You can uh, read your writes. You can do single row updates, which is why it is attractive for a different kind of workload. And uh, the HBase support that you find in Impala is patterned relatively closely after what you find in Hive at the moment. Um, you need to map your HBase table into the Impala table in a particular way. Once you do that, though, you can transform, in particular, the OT of your HBase table needs to be mapped into a string column in your Impala table. Once you do that, you can, Impala will transform qualifications on that column into started stop keys for uh, HBase. Meaning that you can, through Impala, do single row lookups or do range scans against HBase. Um, Impala does not do a number of other things, such as nested loop joins at the moment, and uh, data at the moment also needs to be stored as text. So there are several limitations uh, that you might run into in practice, and I will talk more in detail at the end of the talk about uh, the future roadmap for evolving page based support. This basically is what Impala looks like from the user's perspective. I will talk a little bit about uh, the performance benchmarks that we run internally and the results we, um, we have. So one popular benchmark is uh, TPCDS, and uh, we basically took 20 queries from TPCDS, broke it down into three categories, 
interactive, very short running queries over short time ranges, reports which run over longer time ranges such as months, and then what we call deep analytics, which basically run over the entire data set, which in this case represents five years of data, roughly one terabyte. Main memory, this was run on a cluster of 20 machines um, of basically modern, modern server hardware. And uh, here this is a comparison of uh, Hive and Impala. And as you see in all these categories, Hive takes a substantially longer period of time in order to run any of these queries. These show geometric means of query execution times in each of these categories. Basically, in summary, this is what we found. Uh, depending on the particular query, you see very dramatic speed ups up to a factor of uh, 68, something in that order. And uh, we also looked at uh, multi-user performance. So uh, most people do not run single, uh, single user query workloads. Most people are really interested in having multiple users run queries against the same cluster. Um, how does Impala fare there? And this basically shows you the progression of the same set of queries against the same benchmark data set, but now with concurrent clients submitting queries in parallel. And uh, naturally, as you hit cluster resource limitations, response times go up. But you also see that uh, response times grow up gradually. And, uh, and interestingly, even at the maximum that we measured, which was 24 concurrent clients, when you look at the exact times, you will see that compared to Hive, this is still substantially faster. So Impala on 24 concurrent clients still runs a uh, factor of three or something or more faster than Hive with just one client. This is another view of what happens in a, with a multi-user workload. Here we're measuring basically queries per second, total query throughput. And as you can see, uh, initially as you have a uh, few clients, QPS keeps going up until you basically hit resource saturation at which point the levels of office stays flat. This is actually a good result. This means that even as you increase your current workload, the system is not wasting resources. You do not see this dropping off, meaning uh, <clears throat> you're not all of a sudden wasting your cycles or your memory accesses. This concludes the uh, performance comparison section. Again, if you have questions, feel free to ask. Otherwise, I will go on. What was the base level amount of RAM memory They were, this was a, uh, an all in memory workload. This was on the order of a quarter uh, terabyte machine. <clears throat> I'll move on to the Impala architecture. And uh, so Impala basically shows up as two binaries. One is the Impala daemon, which I, as I pointed out before, runs on all nodes in the system that have relevant data. So on all nodes that run data nodes or region servers for HBase. There's also one binary called the state store. Uh, it provides, the current version of Impala provides a name service. It knows about all Impala daemons that are running and all Impala daemons through this mechanism know about all the other Impala daemons. Um, the way Impala executes queries under the covers is uh, strongly reminiscent of the way a, uh, an MDB database system or a parallel database system handles query processing. What happens is uh, a query arrives via OBC or JDBC, it then gets handed off to the, the planner, which uh, looking at the uh, metadata of the query determines a plan, a, uh, basically a tree of query operators and which it turns into a collection of planned fragments, which then get handed off to a coordinator process that initiates execution across the entire cluster. Um, while the crew is running, um, Impala demons on all of the nodes that have relevant data for that query are concurrently executing and streaming data between them. And uh, in turn, eventually, data goes back to the coordinator and through the coordinator goes back to the client. Here's a dynamic view of that system. Um, here's an example of a cluster consisting of three nodes, each of which runs a data node and an HBase region server, and also the Impala daemon, consisting of 
different components, the planner, coordinator, and executor, each of which run in uh, threads, and uh, each of which also has multiple threads running. So there's no, no single thread that has one particular role. When a query shows up, um, the query planner kicks in and uh, works on producing a collection of planned fragments. And this it does with the help of metadata that it got from the Hive Meta Store as well as the uh, HDFS name node and the data node. That metadata is cached and I'll go uh, into what exactly that constitutes and how the caching works and how it's invalidated in a little bit. So once the planner produced the sequence of planned fragments, it hands it off to the query coordinator, which in turn then talks to each of the running and power demons. While the query is running, um, the query executors perform scans, they do joins, and then exchange data between them, and data will go back to the coordinator as well. Was there a question? Yeah. What happens if the coordinator crashes? And do you always have to talk to the coordinator first and then he can choose the worker, or how do you connect to the control cluster? Sure. The, uh, the question was, I'll repeat that, I don't know if anybody, uh, everybody can hear it. The first question was, what happens if the coordinator crashes? The second question was, uh, basically, as I understood, is there a single coordinator that's, uh, that you always have to thread through in the entire system? So what happens is, first of all, all the polydemons are peers. They all perform the same tasks, and so any of the polydemons in the cluster can act as a coordinator. So if you have a high query workload, you probably want to run random and load balance across the Impala demons. If the uh, node that acted as a coordinator for your query crashes, your entire query is aborted, and you will basically have to rerun your query. Again, not a big deal because you can basically resubmit that same query to any of the nodes in the system and be able to re-execute. So, so it's merely the host name? Give it a different name or goes to the right or the left. Exactly. Yes. Okay, so it's your JDBC connection. Exactly. Yeah. You can simply point it. Question again was uh, is it just a matter of configuration? What it points to? Yes, it's a matter of configuration. And you can also put a load balance in between that then round robins across all the nodes in the system. This was an overview of how query execution works. Um, I'll start going into more detail, in particular, starting with the planning process. Planning is a two-phase process. Uh, in the first phase, you take the query and turn it into a single node execution tree. So this is a, a lefty tree of plan operators, and I'll go into details and give an example of what that exactly looks like. And once you end up with a single tree of plan operators, the second phase does the plan partitioning, um, which takes the plan and breaks it up into fragments, which are then later on assigned to individual nodes and uh, that are running the system. The goal of the partitioning is, uh, on the one hand, to maximize data locality and minimize data movement, and the other goal is to uh, paralyze all of the operators that are part of the query. In particular, joins are parallelized either into broadcast joins or partitioning joins. And I'll give an example of that. Um, you have aggregation operators, which are also parallelized both into a pre- and a merge aggregation phase. And there's also the order by limit clause, which gets turned into a top n operator, which again is parallelized to the largest possible extent. Um, the GA version has one limitation, which is that it does not do cost-based join or order optimization yet. So the order in which you specify the tables in your front clause is the order in which joins will be executed. Um, going back to the first phase of planning, like I mentioned, uh, the goal is to, exit, to construct a plan tree consisting of operators such as scans. Scans are specialized for the underlying storage manager, so there's an HDFS scan and an HBase scan. You have uh, a join operator, which is a hash join. You have hash aggregation. There's also a union operator corresponding to the union statement and a top N operator. And uh, there's also an operator that facilitates data exchange. 
And to uh, give an example, let's start with a query that does basically um, reads from three tables, does two joins, uh, starting with a large table in HDFS joining to another large table in HDFS, which is, which is then joined to a small table regarding HBase. Uh, this is then aggregated and uh, there's grouping happening and uh, this is followed by an order by with a limit clock. So here is what the uh, first phase of the planning process would construct out of that. As you can see, this is the this basically represents a tree that does both join operations um, based on the scans of the input tables followed by an aggregation followed by a top end node. In the second phase, you have plan distribution. And uh, this, like I said, the goals here are to maximize scan locality and minimize data movement. Now, scan locality is very important for performance. Doing remote reads or HDFS is very expensive compared to doing local reads. So um, data movement in general is very expensive too. Every time you have to move data, you have to touch it, meaning you have to copy it into something. You use the network. You have to copy it back from your input buffers into um, your in-memory representation, etc. cetera. Um, so you want to minimize that. And of course, you also want to distribute all of the query operators as far as that is possible. In particular, one of the most common query operators, obviously, is a join. So uh, Impala does two kinds of joins. One is a broadcast join, where the right-hand side table um, fits into the uh, memory of the node it is running on and uh, is small enough so copying that data into every node on which the query is running is relatively cheap. Uh, when you do that, that means that the left hand side of the join can be done completely local and you don't need to move and repartition the left hand side of the join. This is typically the case when you're joining something like a fact table in a data warehouse with a small dimension table, such as, uh, let's say, number of regions, geographic regions, or um, something like a date lookup table. Um, the other way of executing the join is to repartition both inputs, the left and the right hand side input. This allows you to run joins against much larger tables. Um, comes with a cost, which is that you have to repartition both left and right hand side of the, uh, of the join. The decision which one should be uh, done in practice is based on cost, or at least on uh, cost as represented by the statistics that are present in uh, your metadata. So Impala basically uh, would like you to collect statistics about the cardinality of the tables and the size of the data that we store in the individual columns. And based on that, it will try to figure out whether moving the data for a broadcast join is less expensive or whether repartitioning both tables is less expensive. Uh, one, <coughs> one note here is that uh, if those statistics are not available, you're also able to specify the particular join distribution mechanism through a hint when you run the query. There was a question. Yes. inside any of the machines on which the query is running. So it's still distributed across all machines, but within one machine it's running a single thread. That is correct, and the plans going forward are to support intra-query parallelism on a single machine. So, uh, which boils down to intra-operator parallelism, but it may not be on, a, on an operator-by-operator -operator basis, which uh, has other costs associated with that. So going forward, we will support um, basically parallel uh, join execution and hash aggregation execution on a single machine. Yes. <clears throat> so 
so this was, uh, again, we're going back to how to parallelize the query operators. Another operator um, that is good for parallelization is aggregation, obviously, and aggregation is broken up into a pre-aggregation step where the first data is first materialized and a merge aggregation step, which happens um, in order to basically correct the pre-aggregation and summarize the pre-aggregation results. Uh, if you have grouping in your query, as we did in the example, the merge aggregation step is uh, parallelized by repartitioning the pre-aggregation results on the grouping columns. Um, another parallel operator is top n, basically all by followed by limit, which is also done initially at every, um, every node where the data is initially materialized, followed by a final top n aggregation across all those nodes. So I will go back to that example. In the example, you did two joins on three tables, um, two of which were large, one was small, followed by aggregation, followed by top n. Here's what the plant tree looked like. And in this example, um, this is how the parallelization works into plant fragments. First of all, you want to execute all scans locally. Um, that means that each scan sits in its own fragment. Um, the first join is between a two large tables, which means that it, pre it will presumably be done as a partition join. The second join is between a large table or a large intermediate result and a small table, which means it should be done as a broadcast join in this particular example. Then you also have pre-aggregation and merge aggregation, which will be assigned to uh, the two separate fragments, and you have the initial top n and the final top n also, those two will be assigned to two separate fragments. The result of that partitioning is this. Um, you see that the scans, all three of which, all three of them are run on their respective uh, data nodes slash region servers. The, uh, first, um, the first join is done, uh, is repartitioned and the fragment itself is co-located on all nodes that also run data nodes. So the first fragment that does not purely do a scan that executes both hash joins and followed by the pre-aggregation. The output of that is then sent and repartitioned into the fragment that does the merge aggregation followed by the initial top n operation. And the result of that is then broadcast, sent, to the final plan uh, fragment that is running on the core data node. So the end result um, always gets materialized in the coordinator fragment, which then gets sent off back to the client. Are there any questions about planning? I mentioned metadata before, and uh, so Impala works with several sources of metadata in the Hadoop ecosystem. One, obviously, is the, um, the mapping of your physical data onto your logical tables, and this is what is stored in, uh, in Metastore. So Impala interacts with Metastore to uh, load that data. There's also the information about the physical location of the actual data, such as block locations, which are uh, resident in the HDFS name node, and also um, the volume IDs on which the individual block replica sits. Impala uses the volume IDs i.e. the disk IDs, in order to do uh, more uh, clever scheduling of when it exactly issues uh, I.O. requests to HDFS. Now, Impala caches, each Impala daemon caches all of that metadata. The goal was to really avoid all synchronous um, queries into the name node or Metastore when you're running a query. So unlike Hive, which uh, because each query takes a relatively long period of time, it doesn't matter so much if you take a few seconds in order to uh, figure out from Metastore the, um, the metadata of the particular table and the columns you query. And in Palo all of that is cached, and there are no synchronous Metastore API calls when you're running a query. And there are also no synchronous calls to the name node or the data nodes to figure out the volume IDs. All of the data is cached which means that as you add data to the system, the uh, cache data gets stale, and you might have to refresh that. In the current version, you would have to do that manually by running a refresh command against 
each particular power demon that is uh, that you want to use as a coordinator node. The goal going forward is to uh, be able to use meta, uh, sorry, the state store, the um, the distribution system for global system state to uh, to distribute also the metadata. The goal also is at some point to uh, make H catalog another source of uh, system metadata. So when Apollo started out two years ago, H catalog didn't exist, which is why we didn't plan on interacting with it. Things have changed, and going forward, Apollo uh, will also support H catalog at some point in the future. So I mentioned before that uh, Impala is written in C++, and that is actually only partially true because only the execution engine is written in C++. The planning side of uh, which I talked about earlier is written in Java simply to facilitate interacting with the rest of the ecosystem, most of which is written in Java and most of which has Java client APIs. The execution engine, though, is written uh, in C++, written from scratch, with uh, performance in mind. And to that end, um, <clears throat> Impala has a canonical in-memory format that puts fixed with data and fixed with data. <laughs> so uh, data such as integers or floats will sit at fixed offsets in memory, which means that if you are, your query contains expressions such as A plus B greater than C, you will be able to, um, to execute that with very few assembly instructions. Um, Impala also uses, makes heavy use of intrinsics, and uh, in particular uses that to great advantage to parse text. Uh, modern CPUs contain a lot of extra functionality that is not really expressed through programming languages, such as finding particular characters in, uh, in character sequences, and you can use that, for instance, to parse out the delimiters in your uh, CSV files or also compute hash values for random bytes. Uh, the biggest win here is to actually use runtime code generation, which, uh, which Impala does through a tool called LLVM. LLVM is a, uh, a compiler toolkit, so to speak. It is open source. It was developed uh, at some university, the name of which I don't remember, many years ago. It is now maintained by uh, a number of people and heavily used by companies such as Apple and Intel. And uh, what happens is that uh, in a normal um, query execution engine, data is always handled in batches. And uh, the operator tree that we saw earlier, basically each operator runs over a batch of rows, does some repetitive operation, and then hands off the results of that to the next operator, which does the same thing. So, uh, inherent in this processing is that most of the most of the time is spent in big loops, and uh, it is very advantageous to optimize those big loops, which is where runtime code generation comes into play. With runtime code generation, you can actually compile, you can create code to execute this big loop on the fly that has a minimal number of branches, and in particular, doesn't do any function calls. So, uh, with this, you can actually run, create code that is optimized to run on modern pipeline CPUs. I mentioned the Impala State Store earlier. The State Store is a single instance that runs in the entire cluster and currently serves as a name service for the entire Impala cluster. Uh, it knows all Impala demons register with the State Store when they start up and in turn they receive the locations of all other Impala demons as the system is running. Um, when new nodes get added, they register themselves with a state store, and which in turn then distributes that these membership changes out to all of the nodes. Um, the state store is a soft state component, meaning that it is not the final store of record for any of the data in the system. Um, if the state store goes away, the entire cluster will still function. It will just get progressively out of date, so it may not know about new systems and new nodes that get added to the cluster. Uh, when the state store comes back up, it simply reinstates itself by creating the existing Impala demons. They will re-register and everything will continue to function as it did before. 
A uh, question we often get is why did we just use Zookeeper for this particular purpose? And uh, we looked at Zookeeper and decided it was not a good match, simply because Zookeeper does several things well that we don't care about, and it does other things that we do care about not particularly well at all. In particular, uh, the Having used or using Zookeeper as a pub subsystem would have necessitated end by end communication, and so in very large clusters, that would have become a real bottleneck at some point. On the other hand, Zookeeper gives you very nice guarantees about serializability and persistence that the state still doesn't care about at all. So we decided to uh, create another component that is much, much smaller than Zookeeper and uh, was therefore perceived to be the better alternative. This basically concludes the, uh, the architecture section of the pod. Um, are there any questions? All right. I will move on to comparing a pod and particularly the architecture to existing systems. So one system that got a lot of, uh, got a lot of notice after its publication was Dremel. Dremel was a, is a tool, an internal tool in Google that basically gives you scalable querying over very large amounts of data. And in particular, what they did was Dremel consists of two things. One is they created a columnar storage format for nested data. At Google, everything is stored in protocol buffers. And so it was necessary, in, uh, in order to be able to operate a column store, it was necessary to come up with a format that lets you shred nested data effectively. Uh, the other component of Dremel is a distributed scalable aggregation mechanism and here, Dremel borrowed very heavily from what parallel data systems do. Um, <clears throat> we felt that in order to achieve the same benefits in the Hadoop ecosystem, it was necessary to create an optimized columnar storage format. And uh, we looked at existing ones, in particular RC file, and saw that they had a lot of problems and didn't really give you the benefits that columnar storage promises. So we started looking at creating something else, and we're joined by Twitter at some point, which had similar goals. And uh, this, the result of that is a new columnar format called Parquet, which was derived from a format called Trevny that Doug Cutting started to work on. Um, I'll talk about uh, Parquet in a little more detail on the next slide. But um, a particular goal was to be able to uh, use it for nested relational data as well. So in that sense, it's similar to column.io, uh, which is Dremel's underlying storage format. So basically putting Impala onto Parquet gives you what is a superset of what Dremel was at the time of the publication in 2010. So I want to talk a little more about Parquet. Parquet, like I said, was conceived to be a, uh, a state-of-the-art columnar format that is amenable to nested relational data. Um, it should be usable, it is usable against all popular serialization formats, meaning it doesn't matter whether the data arrives in Avro, Thrift, or protocol buffers. It is all, you can all store it and convert it into Parquet. Parquet is a container format that does not presuppose any particular input structures. Um, Parquet is also open source and currently hosted on GitHub. Implementation on it is still progressing and the goal is to um, have it be supported on all processing, on all uh, processing frameworks in Hadoop. So Parquet will be supported by Impala, is currently already supported by Impala, sorry. And uh, there's also work going on on providing high survey, which should be available in a relatively short period of time. And uh, Twitter themselves use our heavy users of Pig, and so they, Twitter has been working on uh, making it accessible to Pig and also to MapReduce. And there's also uh, cascading work underway. So the goal is really to have Parquet support in all popular processing frameworks in Hadoop. Now, <clears throat> Parquet is a good format because it stores, unlike RC file, it stores uh, the actual values in their native types. So uh, RC file actually stores everything in ASCII. So even integer data is stored in ASCII. It has to be reparsed and converted back into binary data. Parquet avoids that. Parquet also contains um, support for extensible value encodings. So uh, in particular, run length encoding and dictionary encoding. 
and uh, whatever other encoding formats might come up in the future. Parquet is also uh, also has a pluggable um, compression codex, and there is also support for indexing, so to speak, i.e., for storing um, the data in sorted order and doing lookups inside a single file without requiring a full scan. The other point of comparison, the one that is actually accessible to most users, is Hive, obviously. And uh, I already talked about the performance comparison. The question is, where does this performance discrepancy come from? And uh, so Hive is something that maps SQL queries into a sequence of MapReduce jobs. And the advantage of it is, of course, that it inherits the entire uh, processing framework that MapReduce gives you. In particular, it gives you built-in fault tolerance. The downside was, of course, also that particular advantage, namely that you then have to run all queries through um, the what amounts to a straitjacket that MapReduce gives you. On top of that, uh, Hive is also was built with a lot of extensibility in mind. Internally, it is very extensible. Not only do you have UBS, you can also have pluggable file formats and a host of other things, and all of which kind of conspires to add a lot of overhead. And this is where the primary uh, uh, performance difference comes from. And this is where power obviously went in the exact opposite direction, something that where you almost shave off, you shave off as much overhead as possible with uh, a somewhat small degree of extensibility, and uh, you get a measurable performance benefit. So the way, from another table, sure. Um, so the way you insert data into Hive is basically uh, you create the table in Hive and through DDL, through create table statement, and you declare the uh, file formats. And then you simply copy your data into HDFS, either that or it is already in HDFS, and you simply have to move it into that table's uh, directory. So Impala can read the exact same data. So if you just want to have that same data accessible through Impala, you don't have to do anything anymore. It's already there. You can also use Impala to convert the uh, file format. This is what is often done through Hive. You have a table that, let's say, is text or text-based, such as sequence file, and you want to create another table, uh, the same data in another file format, such as Parquet, you would then simply create a second table and load data into that second table through insert statement, and so into select. Uh, the same, the exact same thing uh, is possible in Impala. The output formats are more restricted. Right now, Impala can only do text and parquet. We're planning on adding more as well. Um, and you can already insert in bulk into um, HBase as well, another storage manager. But we're planning on adding more output formats, such as Avro data files, for instance, and sequence files as well. But uh, in essence, the mechanisms are the same. Yes. What about Pike? It's, it's a pre-written uh, average job. Uh, well, uh, so the question was how do you or how do you combine and power with pre-existing MapReduce jobs? If I understand it correctly. And the answer is well, pre-existing MapReduce jobs have to materialize their output somehow. The output gets materialized in HDFS, and as as soon as it is in HDFS, it is queryable through Impala. So you basically have a trivial way of combining uh, MapReduce with Impala. Right? MapReduce always needs a discrete input and output phases that write and read from HDFS. So since you have materialized data, it is visible to Impala as well. Can you use the right functions that are in MapReduce? I'm not sure I got the understood the. Oh, uh, so if I understand the question correctly, it was that if you have user defined functions that you use in your MapReduce jobs, can you use them inside? Okay. 
So in Palo right now, it does not use uh, supporting the defined functions. That is something we're trying to address. If that uh, if that answers your question, um, yes. So how would uh, how would Palo compare to Apache uh, Drill or Spark and Sharp as a combination in terms of performance? That is a good question. Um, so I cannot really speak for Drill. I don't work on Drill. And the only thing I know for a fact about Drill is that it is not a runnable system. So I don't think anyone has ever run a query against Drill, so I can't really speak of the performance, to the performance of Drill. I don't know. Um, Spark or Sharp, I haven't run it uh, against that. Spark and Shark are basically combine a runtime system. Spark combines a runtime system with a caching layer. So in order to take advantage of caching, uh, you basically have to load your data into Spark. Uh, that means that once it's cached in Spark, it is not accessible to anyone outside of Spark, obviously. So that is something we're trying to avoid. And to that end, we're more interested in a caching layer that works directly with HDFS and would make basically cache performance available to any HDFS client. Uh, there's a question about the uh, I'm not, I can't really, uh, I couldn't really understand it all that well if you would like to uh, Take advantage of the microphone. Right. And uh, I want to know is it going to the same program pattern as not getting jobs or is it going to be a different type of content? Do you have any insight on that? Sure. The, uh, <clears throat> anyway, user-defined functions, just uh, giving me some background, is one of the most uh, frequently requested features that Apollo doesn't support yet. So this is on uh, the top of the list of what we're going to add in in terms of new functionality. The specific shape it's going to take is, on the one hand, uh, what I would call legacy Java UVS, so basically what Hive does right now. Uh, Hive supports UVS that are basically called on a per column value or per row basis, and basically do a commutation and return a result. And uh, Impala will be able to do the same thing. However, that comes with a very high performance penalty. So if you really care about performance, that might not really be what you are looking for. So we will also be looking to support uh, native UVFs, meaning UVFs written in C, C++, that work in conjunction with the code generation framework that we're using. So UVFs basically that make functionality accessible without a performance penalty. Um, more um, additional functionality that is also requested is uh, SQL authorization, so basically grant and revoke statements, and user roles and permissions on tables and columns, and uh, particular kinds of access. Uh, of course, all of I without a limit, and window functions, so basically rollout functionality. And uh, another question. Uh, or by building or no? Like, or by the, does, the, does the data set still need to be memory or by? No, 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 it would be uh, out of core or uh, okay. um, And then, of course, support for structured data types. So, representation of what in the high schema are um, structs, arrays, and maps. I have uh, spoken about H based support in the current version and the limitations of that. Of course, we would like the limitations to go away. And in particular, what we're interested in is support for uh, composite keys. If your natural uh, key is, let's say, an integer followed by an integer, you don't really want to have to map that into a string and then map that into a single string column and try to access the data by remapping it into strings. You really want to map that into two integer columns. That should be possible. Um, you also really want to have, obviously, insert up the release statements against HBase, so you can use it more like a regular database system. You would like to be able to do interactive single row inserts or updates. And then, um, of course, if you want to do really small joins, you would like to do nested loop joins, not just um, hash joins that need to scan a large part of a table. There are also a number of runtime optimizations that we're looking into. Let me interrupt that, yes? On the edge case, the performance was the same in all performance here, but in the edge case, the performance so the question is, uh, is the performance similar or comparable between HBase 
Impala running on HBase and Impala running on HDFS? And the answer is no, absolutely not. Because HBase simply does not give you the scan throughput that you get from HDFS. And that is a limitation of the HBase architecture. HBase writes out the equivalent of SS tables in which it needs to re-merge when it reads things back in. And that is simply a CPU-heavy <coughs> operation. And so HBase is fairly limited in terms of the uh, maximum throughput at which you can scan data. So right now, and again, this is a limitation of HBase itself, and Pala has nothing to do with that. And right now, you will need to choose between whether you need the online capabilities of HBase or whether you prefer the scan um, efficiency of HDFS. Yes? Um, this would be different from the browser relation databases like Vertica or Paraxel, but I was just wondering if uh, there is some performance benchmark comparison between the two by or the RB that or will it always be slower than Vertica or Paraxel? So the question is, uh, this is not, this is different in some way to Vertica or Paraxel, um, but there is a columnar format. Uh, will there always be a difference? And can I quantify the difference right now? And uh, the, to answer your last question, can I quantify the difference? No, I can't because I simply have not run those benchmarks. And my guess would be that right now Vertica would indeed be faster simply because they have worked on this for a good deal longer and they do optimizations that we haven't got to wrap to. But there is no built-in reason why there would be a performance difference. The uh, in particular the parquet format is uh, a very efficient columnar format, and while I don't know ex the exact details of Vertica's format, uh, partly also because it hasn't been published and it's proprietary, but there's no reason why there would be any disadvantage. Likewise, you know, there's only so much you can do with data, in other words, uh, over time, you will see that whatever gap exists, you will see that close or maybe invert. Um, Runtime optimizations. One thing is Scrapper handling. Well, does do Scrapper handling right now. So if you have nodes in your cluster that are particularly slow, they will impact uh, total query execution time. Another thing that I mentioned was join all optimization. It is not done at the moment and it is desirable simply because uh, then you don't have to be aware of the join order and don't have to do it yourself. And it also allows um, the I tools to run more effectively against Impala. Another thing that already came up was cache management. The way it works right now is that uh, we use the OS buffer cache, meaning there are certain performance penalties uh, to accessing data that is in cache. Like you have to pull it uh, back out, you have to copy it into your own address space, etc. So the goal is to come up with something that gets rid of these additional overheads and use the cache and your aggregate memory in the cluster more effectively. Another thing that I mentioned was metadata management, and in particular automatic metadata distribution. So you don't need to run, um, run manual refreshes of the metadata. And then another thing that comes up a lot and is very desirable, since Impala is, it was designed to be run in a share of basically compute resources with your existing mappings installation, and run in the same cluster, and in particular run against production data, it is very desirable to be able to introduce quotas and ensure some kind of resource isolation so that you can run production jobs with SLAs but still be able to run exploratory queries on your production data. So this is again uh, future of work. This basically concludes my talk. Um, as was pointed out, Impala has been released and is now in GA as of Tuesday of last week. It is available in a, a for a number of operating system distributions, RHEL, various versions of RHEL, Ubuntu, SLES, and Debian. Um, that is an actively monitored user list. So uh, you can, first of all, Impala is very easy to install using Cloudera Manager, highly automated. And uh, if you still run into problems, the user list, like I said, is actively monitored. And uh, we are always quick to respond to user questions. Yes? Yes. Yes, there is a uh, question was, do you need particular versions of CDH? And yes, you do. You can run it on CDH 4.1 and 4.2. The reason is, the reason I'm not supporting older versions is that there were a number of improvements in HDFS that went into CDH 4 and 4.1 in particular, and 4.2, that Power takes advantage of, in particular, short circuit reads that uh, give you much higher scan throughput. 
And uh, so this is why Impala is basically reliant on that. Yes? What is the minimum memory requirement to run Question was, what is the minimum memory requirement in order to run Impala? And there's no particular minimum memory requirement. Uh, your memory, the available memory will determine uh, what you can join and how big of an aggregate result you can compute. So since all of that resides in memory across all nodes in the cluster, this gives you a kind of the queries that you're running uh, will determine how much memory you will want to have. But it will depend on your workload. Um, okay. Anyway, someone. Uh, so I'm curious, in um, you know, number of databases, you have a certain kind of query, you know it's going to be run relatively frequently, you know, sort of key filtering by accommodation of keys. You know, relationally, you have an index, and in you have projections that in theory speed that up, that access, and filtering, one kind of thing. Is there something similar to that in, uh, in Paula, or is the columnar storage format such that you don't have to have that kind of thing? How, how does that work? Sure. So the question was that if you have frequently running queries, uh, existing relational database systems give you some tools such as secondary indices or projections in the case of Vertica. What is the equivalent for Impala slash Hadoop? And uh, so this shows that the answer is there's no particular equivalent, in part because um, using HDFS as a storage manager, you do not have direct control over how data is moved into the system. In an existing relational database system, including Vertica, data always has to be moved through that database system. You have to run an insert statement or a load command in order to add data. Whereas in HDFS, all you have to do is basically copy a file into a particular directory. So things happen without the uh, Impala necessarily being aware of it. So you cannot rely on basically having a gatekeeper and being able to maintain that secondary index the same way a relational database system can. So you would have to come up with a way, you can of course create another table that materializes the data pre-computed in a way that speeds up your query. And you would have to find a way to do that um, on the side and make it part of your data ingestion process. Go yes. back to the earlier question. Um, do you find out, so I don't have memory my machine earlier, and I usually see statistics on the tables um, I'm trying to think. Uh, so the question is, if you find out you're running out of memory, do you get a signal from Impala in any particular way um, that will tell you how much memory you should have? And I believe you get fairly specific runtime profiles, and you might find out, I think you would be able to find out exactly what you need, yes. Uh, you said that you were looking to do not just analytics, but also transaction processing? Yeah, so the question is, uh, we talked about analytics, you also mentioned transaction processing, and how does that work? And so Impala itself, let me clarify, Impala is not a uh, fully functional relational database system, which consists of a query engine plus a storage manager, both of which are tightly integrated. Impala gives you the query engine component and relies on the storage manager to give you transactional capabilities. Now HDFS does not have that, and HBase is basically the only storage manager that gives you any semblance of transactional capabilities, but it is also, HBase will not allow you to do multi-row transactions. You are limited to single-row transactions in HBase. Okay. So Impala can only reflect what the underlying storage manager will give you. Would you still have like 300 people connecting, running, and updating records at the same time, or far enough? Yes, you could. The question is, can you have very many concurrent users uh, well, yeah. banging away on the same underlying table? And the answer is yes. And that if they all try to update the same record, of course, that's going to be the bubble um, If you're just trying to insert data in parallel, you can do that. And same with updates and deletes. Yes. Except, I mean, Impala does not support update and delete against HBase right now. It's a goal to add that functionality. But yes, in principle, you would be able to do that. Are you going to have like stored procedures? That can... There are no plans. Question is, is Impala going to support stored procedures? And the answer is there's no particular plan to add that right now, simply because it hasn't been requested all that much yet. Okay. Uh, UDFs have been more popular. 
So the question was, uh, how does Impala do resource management? In particular, if you run Impala on an existing MapReduce cluster with other MapReduce jobs, uh, is Impala aware of what's running? And the answer is no. At the moment, what you have to do is basically you have to set up Impala in an existing cluster such that you isolate MapReduce from Impala. And you do that by um, running Impala inside a C group that limits memory consumption. You can also impose a per process uh, memory limit on running Impala demons, so that queries that tip the total memory consumption over the limit get aborted. Um, you can give each query a, pro a per query memory limit, a per node per query memory limit. And uh, you also need to reconfigure your cluster so it has fewer map and reduce slots, because uh, if you're already maxing out your cluster completely with map reduce jobs, there won't be any spare cycles left to run Impala. Yes. How does it achieve? Oh, uh, the question was how does Impala uh, in terms of performance compared to Nantesa, and I didn't understand who else. But let's talk about Nantesa. I do not know because again, I have not run. I do not have an in-house Nantesa instance, and we haven't run any benchmarks against Nantesa, so I have no idea. Uh, I would like to find out, so if, you, uh, if you're running a pizza, I encourage you to install Impala as well and uh, tell us what looks nice. Yes? Impala doesn't have this uh, PNC pre uh, itself Right. Um, so the question was, how do you compare Impala to uh, EMC's Greenplum slash R? Um, again, I do not work for EMC on Green Plum or on R, so I do not have specific details of uh, how exactly this architected. And the information that EMC itself gives out is a little sparse. A little, uh, they don't really tell me all that much. One thing that uh, I uh, kind of guessed from the available literature is that it does not necessarily co-locate the processing with the data. So uh, it sounds like you still need to pull the data over the network. Even though Park can read data directly from HDFS, it still does not co-locate. And uh, while that might not sound so bad if you're running on um, high-speed networks against a disk-based system, that all of a sudden starts to look very bad if you're running against in-memory data, because no matter how fast your network is, you will never be able to match the 25 or 30 gigabytes a second that your memory bus can give you. So I think that alone is a, uh, in my mind, a crucial architectural flaw. And uh, I think uh, Impala will heavily benefit from co-locating processing with the data. Does Impala do pipeline? Yes, so the question is, does Impala do pipeline query execution? And the answer is yes. Um, a, between plant fragments, which run on different nodes, all of that runs in parallel, and data is sent directly from node to node using interprocess communication, and uh, it parallelizes as much as possible. Yes? Any more query questions? Does support the Question was, does Impala support uh, Hive's notion of partitioning? The answer is yes, it does. Impala is aware of the partitions, and Impala then um, uses um, predicates against the partition key columns in the where clause in order to prune the amount of data it reads. Yes? Any plans to add uh, stored outliers to Um, it hasn't shown up very high on the list of things that people want to see. 
This may well change if you have environments where you're running relatively short queries, but a very high uh, number of these, a very high QPS, in which case the planning overhead might become significant, but we just haven't seen that yet. But uh, that doesn't mean we're not going to see it in the future, but it also doesn't mean that we're not going to add that functionality at some point. It's just not on the immediate roadmap. Anything else? Yes. Yeah. Yes. So the question was, uh, which companies are using ARM colleges right now? I can name a few. Uh, the best known of which is Expedia. We have we've been running private betas with them since uh, the middle of last year, and there are actually most of these beta customers uh, that are moving on to becoming production customers are unfortunately prohibiting us from mentioning them in public. But uh, for the most part, these are uh, household names and uh, you know, in various industries, such as national retail chains or payment processing companies. Yes. Uh, the monetization strategy in the cloud era is perspective. Is it going to stay as a sort of you pay for support model, or there are certain cloud era features that are like the premium? Pay for, which are, I, don't, I don't know where they're moving direction, they're might migrating away from or towards. Okay. Uh, but where do you see and follow up in that? Or we might have to pay money to use one of those functions one day. So uh, the question here was what is the monetization strategy uh, for Impala now and going forward? And if I become an Impala user now, will I have to be paid, will I have to pay for features going forward? Um, this is, of course, you know, I'm an engineer, and I actually wrote a lot of this. So, funny enough, nobody has asked me that so far. Um, I can't speak to that. My guess is absolutely not. Whatever is free right now, which is all of the functionality. So right now, you would pay for, if you wanted Cloudera to support it, and in particular, give you support with SLAs, you would have to pay Cloudera for that. And Cloudera itself is free. You can download it, you can install it, and uh, run it to your heart's content on however many nodes you want. And uh, my guess is that will not change at all. Uh, I know you said that part of it has been converted from Java to C++, uh, there's a, but you're still using HTFS. Now, is that part of the Java virtual machine, or there's a company called Mapbar that did away with the uh, file system altogether and used a different file system. So, do you perceive that there are limitations to the Java framework? Or okay, so let me try to paraphrase the question. The question was, um, I spoke of Impala running both uh, native code and Java code. Impala accesses HTFS, which itself runs 